AWS has many different storage services. In this next section, we're gonna talk about the differences between the primary storage mechanisms. Let's start off by discussing uh, an overview of these applications. So there's S3, which is uh, simple object storage. So, so this is an object level storage device. We've got EBS, which is block level storage. We have EFS, which is really an NFS uh, service that AWS manages. We've got Archive with uh, Glazier. We've got Snowball, which is for uh, offsite import. So you can grab uh, huge terabytes of data and import it via an external device. You've got Snowball Edge, so you can move in huge quantities of data via this edge-based device. And then you also have AWS Snowmobile, which is a pretty interesting service where you can literally take a truck full of data and move that into AWS. And then you've got the AWS storage gateway here. And what that does is allows your uh, private data center here, you can actually take that and upload it into the storage gateway. So let's break these down one by one here and talk about some of the characteristics of EBS. Uh, EBS allows you to create individual storage volumes and attach them to EC2 instances. And this is a block level storage. And the volumes are automatically replicated amongst the availability zones, right? So you can see that these AZs are automatically taking care of copying the data back and forth. They also can be backed up to S3. So you can create snapshots and keep uh, these volumes there. So some of the use cases are boot volumes and storage for Amazon, data storage for file systems, database hosts, enterprise hosts. There's lots of uh, flexibility because of this ability to create these snapshots and, and restore them. Now let's break into some block versus object storage discussion here. So wh why, why would you use one versus the other? Well, let's talk about block here for a second. Uh, with block, uh, what happens is you can update one piece of a file, right? So you can you can go through here and let's say you have a large uh, one terabyte file here. You can actually update just a very small amount of it because this block uh, allows you to make these incremental granular changes. But with object storage, you can't incrementally make a change to it. Uh, you actually have to update the entire thing. So the entire block actually gets updated. So that's really the, the big difference here is that in the case of S3, you have this object storage, and if you have very large files, it's great, but you're, you can only make a change that's uh, all at once. But if you have a block level device, you can make these incremental changes. So it's up to you to decide uh, you know, when you wanna use one solution versus, versus another. Now, block storage is typically faster and uses uh, more bandwidth, but it is actually, a lower cost, so we can say this is lower cost. This is this is a higher cost here. Now let's talk about some of the different EBS volume types that are available. So solid state drives uh, are really the the latest generation of uh, EBS volume types, and they have a very fast performance and a couple different flavors they come in. One of them is just a general purpose flavor. And those can get all the way up to uh, 16,000 IOPS. Uh, but with provisioned IOPS, you can actually go uh, all the way up to 64,000 uh, IOPS on a, on a specific EBS volume. Now, there's a much slower uh, type of older device, and that's the um, regular spinning hard disk. So SSDs are actually uh, memory-based, and HDDs are actually physical disks. And you can see here, in terms of the um, IOPS here, these are only 500 or 250 in the case of cold. So the performance here is just off the charts, and this is uh, very bad, right, in terms of performance. So this is really for... Uh, situations where you want to infrequently uh, access the data, and this would be your primary data store for um, uh, IOPS intensive applications like deep learning, for example, or databases or, or things like that. So it's really important to know which one you're getting and, and how you're going to choose a, a specific workload. And also it's important to note that in the case of EBS, 
in very specialized situations, you even could stripe mini EBS volumes together. And I've done this before in computer vision workflows where I've created volumes that had 200,000 IOPS, for example, by striping many different uh, solid state drives together. Another thing to point out as well is that there's several use cases for each one of these. So in the case of the general purpose, uh, SSD, this would be for most workloads or virtual desktops, a development test environment for provisioned IOPS. In this case, when would you want to use this? This would be maybe a database that's a very specific uh, high performance database. Maybe, maybe it's an Oracle database that you need to actually uh, get very high performance on. What about these uh, older devices? When would you want to use these? Um, this could be used in, in the cases of big data, right? Maybe the big data workload uh, is actually used in parallel. It's a um, it's used in, in, in a very uh, inexpensive cluster, like a Hadoop cluster or log processing. Uh, what about the cold storage here? When would you want to use this? This would be where you had, uh, you really, cost was the most expensive uh, or most important thing to th consider. Uh, you would want to go to this, this cold storage uh, option. All right, let's talk about the um, some of the features of, of the Elastic block storage system. One of them is that you can create snapshots. So the, these can actually be um, point in time uh, snapshots. And this is really important because you can keep track of a server at a specific time or a database at a specific time, and then also recreate a new volume based on that snapshot. You also can encrypt the uh, volumes, and this is no uh, extra cost. So this could be a, a way to increase the security of your application. Your data could be encrypted at rest. And then also in terms of elasticity, you can make these volumes go up. So maybe you start with 100 gigabytes. You can actually uh, rapidly increase that to 100 terabytes, right? So you can, you can change uh, very quickly the volume types here. Uh, or the size, and that's one of the, the key features. Another thing to be aware of as well is that these uh, Amazon EBS volumes persist independently from the instance. So you can you can take it off and put it on some one machine and then attach it to another thing. Uh, another thing you can do as well is you can, as we discussed before, change the amount of IOPS that are associated with one instance versus another. Also, it is important to know that these snapshots, there is a charge associated with them. So if you're creating lots of backups, you will incur costs and you have to be careful about how many snapshots you wanna keep. Maybe you only keep 30 days with the snapshots. And then also in terms of the data transfer, right? So if you're moving data in and out here is that you always can do the inbound for free, but if it's outbound, it's gonna cost, uh, it's gonna cost money to do outbound transfer. All right, let's talk about uh, another storage device, the object storage device, S3. So what are the things that are important to know about in terms of Amazon S3? One is that you can store as many objects as you want. So you can almost think of this as an infinite storage mechanism. It would be really difficult, in fact, to, to uh, uh, really store more data than, it, than, than they could actually support. And then in terms of bucket names, the bucket names themselves they have to actually be unique. So that's one really important thing about bucket names. <clears throat> also, Amazon S3 can't be used as a bootable drive. The data is also stored independently. And you can also access this data, and we'll talk about this more in a bit, but you can access it from a command line tool, from an SDK, from the console. There's lots of ways to access this S3 data, and that's one of the advantages of it. You also can encrypt the data at rest as well. And also you can change different types of storage um, classes. And then finally, one of the big uh, features of it, and this is probably one of the number one uh, reasons to use S3, is it's got nine nines, right? You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And nine nines reliability means that it's really uh, gonna give you only a few seconds, if at most, of downtime per year. And so this is the most reliable storage other than, let's say, Glacier, which is even more uh, reliable than S3. Now, let's talk about some of the different uh, storage classes here next. In terms of Amazon, there's standard storage class. That's one option. You also have um, intelligent tiering. Uh, so we'll call that IT. You've got, um, in the case of standard, standard offers high durability, availability, and performance 
of objects. So this is really kind of a default to go to. Now, intelligent tiering, what this does is it optimizes costs by moving data to the most cost-effective tier automatically. So what will happen is it'll look at data that you haven't used, and it'll put it into another section for you. There's also, uh, we'll call this um, infrequent access. So we'll call that IA. And with infrequent access, what that does is allows you to um, have data that's less, less frequently accessed it, it'll it'll actually reduce the cost. So this is a combination of low cost and high performance. And then you've got the um, uh, S3 standard IA. So we'll call this uh, S3 um, standard IA. And with, and with uh, that um, S3 standard IA, this is a way of uh, accessing less frequently data, but all, but you also need to have rapid access when you do need it. There's also, um, S3 one zone and frequent access. So this is, we'll call this S3 one zone and frequent access. And what that does is, is it just puts the data in one zone. And then finally, you've got a couple different glacier options here. We'll just call these the glacier options. And with the glacier options, these are uh, the most cost effective. And, and these actually are able to keep your data uh, accessed in, in this archive system and it's the lowest cost and long-term retention option. So there's lots of different, uh, the main takeaway here is that there's many different ways that you can use S3. So let's again break down here some of the differences between uh, an object and, and a bucket here. So I think that's another really import, important thing to break down here is when would you care about uh, an object and a bucket and what are the different parameters here? Well, one of the things to be aware of is that uh, with an object, the URL you're going to get will be something like um, uh, this is the region here. So let's go through and do this. This will be the region. Uh, and then you'll have a bucket name. So we'll call this. And then finally, at the very end, you'll have the key. And the key is actually the thing that is associated with your object. And in the case of a bucket, you'll have the region name here at the very top. And then you'll have dot, let's say, Amazon uh, AWS. And then, uh, again, the bucket name uh, will go here. And this is where the bucket name will be. So you have a couple different ways that URLs are created. And this can really be helpful. And a bucket can be created in any AWS region. And you can upload in essentially an infinite number of, of objects to that bucket. And that's one of the huge advantages, again, of, of S3. So what are some ways that you can actually access this uh, data? So one of the things to be aware of is that uh, S3 is really a, a, a centralized application or centralized interface for accessing data throughout AWS. And so uh, Cloud9, which is one of my favorite development environments, this is a, an easy way to access S3. You also can use a command line tool so this can be, let's say, in Cloud9, or it could be on uh, SageMaker, or it could be on your own laptop. Also, the AWS tools, like let's say Bodo3, which is one of my favorite libraries in Python to access uh, Amazon. And then also just the console. You can just go to the console, and you can upload and download data. And we'll, we'll actually demo uh, these methods uh, when we actually access the, uh, uh, the S3 interface as well. So in a nutshell, uh, S3 uh, is actually a data lake, and this data lake can be accessed by almost every AWS resource. Okay, let's talk about some use cases for AWS S3. Uh, one of the ways is for an application's um, assets. So this could be your image files, for example, your video files, uh, static website hosting, which uh, I demoed uh, earlier. You also can use it for um, backups and disaster recovery, right? For let's say EBS snapshots, you also can use it as a data lake. And this is really a, a new uh, capability that a lot of the services like S3, I'm sorry, like uh, SageMaker use. You can pull data in from S3, you can train a machine learning model on it, and then you can store it back again into S3. So S3 is, is really one of the most fundamental uh, services just like AWS Lambda that you'll access on the AWS platform. Let's talk a little bit about the different pricing options here. So in terms of pricing, uh, in general, it's just like anything else. You're going to pay for only what you use, right? So pay for what you use. 
uh, and also you're also you're going to get charged by the gigabytes that are transferred out per month and also by certain operations like put copy post list and get you don't have to pay to transfer the data into it uh, but you do have to pay when you transfer it from let's say uh, s3 to the cdn which is cloudfront another thing to be aware of in terms of pricing is that the storage classes that you use they'll have different pricing models. So in the case of the standard storage, that's gonna be a more expensive uh, option, right? And then if you go to something like uh, in, infrequently accessed uh, storage option, that'll be a lower cost solution. So it really depends on what kind of storage option that you use, but they're constantly lowering the, the cost for these uh, on a, on a semi-regular basis. So. Let's move on now to the Elastic file system, one of my favorite features of AWS. What is this? This is a uh, NFS mounted um, managed storage system for AWS. And NFS has been around for several decades. I used it when I was working at Caltech. This was how our Unix cluster worked uh, at the university. It's also used a lot in film pipelines. I've used it at Disney Feature Animation, uh, Weta Digital, Sony Imageworks. All these companies uh, in film pipelines use NFS, and now it's moving on to the cloud, and it's a perfect environment for things like, again, um, machine learning, um, big data, uh, also for um, petabyte scale low latency um, uh, data as well, and also the fact that it's been used for so many decades, uh, it works really well in a Linux-based environment. So that's another big takeaway with with uh, Elastic File System. Also, what's handy about it is that the IOPS actually scale up as you use it. So as you put more data onto the Elastic File System, it it, it allows you to expand the IOPS. Another thing I personally use uh, the uh, EFS system for is for deployment. It makes it really easy to deploy software to uh, a cluster of machines. So let's talk about some of the architectural things you can do with uh, the Elastic file system. As I mentioned, um, I've actually used it in many different scenarios. And, and what I've used it for on AWS is in this, here's a situation where you could have a development environment, a staging environment, and a production environment, and you could have a build server, and this build server could actually mount all three of those environments, right? So dev, stage, production. And then every time you make a change to, let's say, GitHub or your whatever repo you're using, it would it could do an rsync, and then it could rsync that data over in let's say under one second and and now anytime i spin up a cluster in production and let's say i have thousands and i've done this before with computer vision pipelines i have thousands and thousands of nodes here all using ec2 or containers they all have instant access to that software so it's a great way to distribute uh, data across multiple environments uh, to a cluster of machines and also you don't have to worry about managing it because it's replicated across the availability zones. And that's a really uh, strong uh, reason to use Elastic File System. Finally, it also has the ability to automatically save costs because it can age out and make certain uh, files that haven't been accessed uh, frequently uh, charge less. So let's go to uh, the final thing we're gonna talk about, which is Glacier, which is again, a data archiving system, right? That's the big thing that Glacier does. And it's designed for extreme durability. So it's, it really takes the place of things in the past, like maybe you would archive your data to tape, right? Really it's a replacement for that. And so some of the things it does is it supports SSL encryption of data in transit and at rest. It has the, the ability to a lock data so that it can't be deleted. And there's three options for access. There's a, uh, expedited, standard, and bulk. And this goes from several minutes to several hours. So uh, some of the things to be aware of as well with Glacier is that it is the, has the ability to automatically uh, encrypt data. And it has some stronger encryption capabilities than the standard a, uh, AWS um, S3 uh, system. So another thing to be aware of as well is that in order to interface with the uh, Glacier ecosystem, you can access it via a REST service, 
You can access it via SDK, or you can also use lifecycle policies. And the lifecycle policies will automatically uh, age things off based on rules you set up. And so these could be, for example, you know, after 30 days or after 60 days or, 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 or potentially even if it's a certain storage class, right, you could automatically move these things into the uh, lifecycle policy. So a few other things to point out about lifecycle policy as well is that with a standard, you know, for example, maybe after 30 days it gets archived, it, but if it's infrequently accessed, uh, maybe it, it goes to 60 days. And then finally, after 365 days, you could say, if it's been in Glacier for a year, what we want to do is we want to delete that data. So you can think of it as a pipeline where you move data and you could have rules either on an object basis or you could even do it at a bucket level. So there's lots of different options here with uh, Glacier. Now, what are some differences between the uh, S3 and uh, Glacier? Well, one of them is that with uh, Amazon S3 and Glacier, there's no limit, right? You can So you can we can think about this. They have infinite storage right so that's that's actually pretty amazing now in terms of latency the latency here is milliseconds in this though the latency is minutes or hours so you're not going to you you don't want to use glacier to retrieve data all the time in terms of the maximum size of an item you can have something that's let's say five terabytes but in glacier you can make something that's 40 terabytes and then finally how are you charge your charge on every single request but in Glacier, you're only re you're you're charged actually on a request, and also on a gigabyte. So those are some of the options here, and because Amazon S3 gives you faster access to the data, the storage cost per gigabyte is a lot higher than Amazon Glacier. Okay, let's talk about a server side encryption with Glacier as well. Another thing to point out about the difference between Glacier and S3 is that uh, the way data is encrypted with Glacier. So server-side encryption is about protecting data at rest, and both solutions offer that, but with, with Glacier, it's automatically encrypted by default. And that's a really important thing to be aware of is that with uh, S3, you have to decide to do it yourself. And with Glacier, that's one of the key capabilities to make the data more secure is that it's got a default level of encryption. Okay, let's wrap this up and talk about some final security things to consider with Glacier is that with Glacier, one of the things that you can do is you can control access via IAM. And this is the management console that allows you to set users, groups, and roles. And that's really important cap security capability. It also encrypts your data with a, a very strong level of encryption called AES-256. And also Amazon Glacier will manage your encryption keys for you. So it's got a very, very strong encryption as we discussed as well. It's, it's enabled by default. And that's uh, because of the nature of the kind of system it is. It's designed to be a very, very secure system.